This is the first proof of a cloned human embryo designed to be transferred into the womb of a woman to produce a baby. It was created by a team led by this man, Dr. Panos Savos, a first-generation Cypriot American who lives beside a lake and a golf course in Lexington, Kentucky, USA. From the beginning, he was very definite about his ambition to clone a human being. Let's get real, as we say in Kentucky. This is a problem that the world will face down the road. And just looking the other way ain't gonna make it go away. This film is the story of the two and a half years that led up to the creation of the embryo, of the formation of the Zavos team, and of the tensions that tore it apart. And of the international negotiations cloaked in the utmost secrecy that led to this extraordinary scientific breakthrough. Rome, March 2001. This is the office, consulting rooms and laboratory of Italian fertility expert Severino Antonori. He's back, he's back to his damn deal. Here he helps infertile couples have a child of their own through in vitro fertilization, IVF. It was in Rome that the first meetings of the team took place. They assembled here from Europe and America. They met secretly to explore a shared interest in human cloning. Some wished and still wish to remain anonymous, for their work isn't yet finished. In the beginning, Antonori led the team jointly with Zavos. He's a bluff, emotional man, famous for helping a 62-year-old woman to have a child through IVF. Typical couple from Italy. Yeah. From, uh, from Napoli. From Napoli, Napoli, Napoli. music, uh, uh, other things. Da quanti anni ho cercato un? Solo sei anni. Six years they wait for the baby, but it's male infertility. The same field. Mm. You understand my the motivation? To why uh, I try to 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 perform new methodology in this case. Maria Pasquale, what is uh, Dr. Antonori to you? Come fosse un padre. Like a father, it's more humanity. Uh, she speaks with me, we feel, but we feel. Dalla, dalla fiducia di tornare. Paneiotis Zavos settled in the conservative south 30 years ago. Our peaceful little mountain home. But the He's a family man who two years ago had just had his first child. Daddy's going to go on an aeroplane tomorrow. He's an andrologist, someone who specializes in male infertility. In Lexington, he runs a successful IVF clinic, a process pioneered in Britain by Patrick Steptoe and Robert Edwards in 1978. IVF produced the first so-called test tube baby, Louise Brown, and human cloning will use many IVF techniques. The spotlight of publicity shone on Steptoe and Edwards and the Browns ever after. Similar media attention surrounds human cloning. This doesn't seem to bother Zavos. Why do you want to clone a human being at all? There is a need for that. I'm not interested in indiscriminately. Uh, cloning human beings just to clone a human being. I, I think that uh, a lot of people would be opposed to that, including myself. I think that there is a tremendous demand uh, for uh, cloning uh, human beings for reproductive purposes, for people that w really want to have a biological child of their own and complete their life cycle. I think that the world needs to debate this issue. And there's a price to be paid for the debate. Yes, but it's not just the pain of uh, scrutiny, is it? It's also, dare I say it, ambition. Sure it is. You know, this is, this, is, this, is, this is in line with the first law of thermodynamics. What goes up must come down. And, uh, you know, in order to get rich, you know that you need to work very hard to do that. In order to be famous, you have to take, take risks. Uh, and you have to have to pay a price. We're willing to take that risk and take the heat and stay in the kitchen. 
The birth of Dolly the Sheep in 1996 at the Rosslyn Institute in Edinburgh showed the way to those who wished to clone a human being. Dolly is now a museum exhibit. And one of the major criticisms the human cloners face is that in animal cloning, success rates are low and unexpected deformities have arisen. Most leading scientists are warning that the difficulties with Dolly should deter anyone from offering cloning as a remedy for human infertility. We are pursuing very aggressively the research aspect of it to overcome some of the hurdles that the animal cloners have had to face. We will not, and I emphasize, we will not experiment on humans. Yes, but you can understand the misgivings of some of your critics that if in animal work a deformed lamb is born, that's very sad. Sure. Uh, if a deformed child is born, uh, that's a tragedy. Sure it is, and I, I, I would take that very seriously. But again, I'm going back to the, to the, to the track record of both myself and Severino. Uh, I mean, you know, we can, be, we can be scrutinized in any way, shape, and form, but we have never been involved in any way, shape, and form with the, the birth of an abnormal baby. Washington, August 2001. It's hard to exaggerate the vigor of the controversy that surrounds human cloning. The world watches every move. The three scientists publicly committed to human cloning were summoned to attend the Senate hearings on reproductive technology. Antinori and Zavos flanked Brigitte Boisselier, a scientist working for a religious sect called the Raelians. Two years later, Boisselier would claim to have helped five cloned babies be born. No one has yet seen evidence, either of the children or of any scientific support for the claims. Um, we, need to go, we need to move on, Dr. Zavos, and, and you'll have a chance, in, uh, you have a chance to speak later. I, uh, we're, you will be given an opportunity. Now, I'd like to thank the speakers very much. The cloning scientists were besieged by the media. The ARTs today, that's the Assisted Reproductive Technologies. If you're a woman under 35, you get approximately 30% success rate uh, and a live birth from that. And what kind of success rate do you think you might get? We can do 30% or better. 30% right yes. away from 30. the start? I think so. Success meaning they'd be born or success meaning they'd be born at normal? Be, be, may, can be born normal. What happens yeah. to the rest 70%? They are going to be born, but they're going to be uh, in trouble. We don't know what's going to happen to the other 70%. Obviously, 70% is, is something that uh, needs to be dealt with uh, in a medical uh, setting. And so, you know, what happens to the other 70%, it's a question that needs to be established uh, between the patient and the physician. Doctor, you have no problem with 70% being born? Doctor, you have no problem with 70% Abnormal. Doctor, you have no problem with 70% of these children being born abnormal? This is a disgrace, Doctor. 70% of these children, by your own words, would be born mutated and have to be destroyed. It is a disgrace. It is a violation of human justice and human rights. Hello, I'm Reverend Pat Mahoney with the Christian Defense Coalition. <laughs> How are you doing? You, you heard the doctor's own words. 70% failure rate. This is human life. These are not laboratory rats. These are human lives should not be used as laboratory experiments. Their children will turn out fine if it's done properly with he proper just screening. Said 70 percent failure. You simply don't allow it. You, have, you don't. You simply. What do you do with them? Huh? What? Obviously, do do they miscarry. They have to be terminated. I'm well, sorry. And, and, that and that is a necessary you price. Kill, no. You, you, you terminate. You can have a terribly deformed child. Nature generally solves the problem by Absolutely carrying not. a miscarriage. How do you know they, they won't have, be born? Dolly's mutating. How Dolly's do you know when the child? Dolly's mutating. She's a little fat no, because how, every how journalist goes aging. in there and gives her a piece how of candy. How do you know when that child is born? And that's why she's overweight. You would be overweight too. Look at all of us. Most of us are overweight. We're not gene mutated. 50 years ago. I know very much. You know what happened? You politics. Agree with politics what happened? got involved. It's not about Poli politics. No, they took the muscle of the it's state. It's a disgrace and they, here. They took the muscle of the state and put it, it put it behind who could breed and how they could breed, and that's just what you're trying to do. Absolutely Telling people not. you have not we the right to reproduce. We are saying that science should you, not create you, monsters. That and you're there saying there should, we should outlaw science. You're, no, you're for outlawing no, science. There are lines to be drawn. That's the embryo in all the women. 
Ten years ago, all people out the women in this case. Now she's a good thing. Professor Antonori likes soccer. Back in Rome a week later, watched by his wife, he was playing for his own football team, the gynecologists. But he was about to become a casualty of his own ambitions. For he also likes publicity, and from the earliest days, this became a tension within the scientific team. Antonori claimed that they had cloned monkeys, and later, that the cloning work would be carried out on an ocean-going liner, all of which was news to his colleagues. Some members of the team are feeling the strain of the publicity attendant on this project more than others. That is correct. And that is really due to the diversity of the personalities involved. It's, you can't assume that everybody is going to take the heat and stay in the kitchen in the same way. The Italian government said they're going to stop you from practicing. What is, what's your reaction? The, Italian, uh, the opposition is tremendous. Professor Antonori said that you decided on the country that uh, you're going to work in. I should make a correction on that. We are in the process of deciding which countries should not just focus in on one location. Because of who we are and what we do, is that if any complications arise, we should be able to make the move into a, as another location if need to. The reality is that for all the talk in Rome and Washington, six months after they announced their intention to try to clone a human baby, the Zavos team are doing very little scientifically. They prefer simply to force the debate ever further into the public arena and wait to see how and when to move forward. Cyprus, May 2002. Zavos has gone home to see his family. Cyprus, in the eastern Mediterranean, is close to where he hopes to base much of his scientific work. This is another generation of Zavos. Later that night, after an international telephone conference call, the scientific team split. There were some extraordinary claims made by your team in Washington, which might have been difficult to substantiate, if I can put it that way. Well, if you're talking about Severino, obviously, I think that Severino does have a tendency of making statements sometimes. I try to coordinate with Severino as much as we can, but uh, being of different cultural backgrounds sometimes, it doesn't help. If you have a troubled child, sometimes you just leave it home or sometimes you don't interact with that child as much or don't pay too much attention because we're simply you want him to understand that you have been a naughty boy and uh, we're not going to play with you. And so life goes on. Can you do it without Severino? Oh, sure. I think that this team is determined to do it with or without Severino or without me or whatever. None of us are indispensable and unreplaceable. Oxford, England. Dr. Zavos is asked to address the Oxford Union. The split with Antonori is not yet public. The motion is that this house approves of human cloning. Neither the Union nor the British scientific community can find anybody publicly to support Zavos. Whether or not he knows it, he's on his own. So there's the speech. The speech? It's going to come out natural. Good, good. At drinks before the debate, he meets for the first time a member of the Rosslyn team that produced Dolly the Sheep, Dr. Harry Griffin. I have never met uh, Ian. No. I hope that I will soon. Uh, well, he's uh, certainly occupied this week, but uh, I don't know. You, know, but you, know, you know full well that we disapprove. Of, uh, well, of course, I take this. And I respect those that disapprove just as much as... Among those who oppose him, Lord Winston, the IVF expert and television personality. <laughs> 23 years ago, Lord Winston probably stood in front of audiences like these tonight and said that Robert Edwards, the gentleman that developed IVF that I have tremendous respect for and gave birth to Louise Brown, who I know personally, stood up and said that this is completely unethical and Robert Edwards would never should be doing this. However, today, no, sir, thank you. Please. 
Mr. No, sir. Please, thank you. All, I would like to continue, order, sir. I would like to continue, sir. You may not have the floor, sir. Please be seated, sir. You can make your clarification later, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, Robert Edwards happens to be a very honorable man that developed a technology that Lord Winston today is using to make a living, and a good living. And I hope that you are not making the same mistake tonight, sir. I have never, ever criticized Robert Edwards publicly. I have never criticized him in print. The truth is that you have surrounded your whole speech with a tissue of non-truths. And that is a real problem because what you are doing is incredibly disreputable. What you are doing is utterly appalling. Do you know, I don't mind if you clone a human being, actually, because I think you would get the full force of the law when inevitably you produce an abnormal child and the parents or the child will sue you through the court and God help you when that happens and you deserve the full force of the law, whether it be in the United States or in Italy. But, but, Dr. Zavos, sit down, please. Well, I must, I must I'm say... I'm afraid you came and you had to be expected to be attacked. You sit there with your little label in your lapel... S sperm egg, sir. A sperm and egg. Look at it. You've got this little circle which represents the egg and the little sperm. Notice where the sperm is. It's shot right through the egg. It's not even fertilising it. <laughs> it's over... It is an aggressive What sperm. you are doing... Dr. Zavas, what you are doing is bringing science into disrepute. And when you do that, you do something very grave indeed, because you halt the very progress which might help the very patients that you claim to want to treat. The audience file out parliamentary style through the two lobbies to record their votes, aye or no. Zavos loses by a large majority. One of the good things that has happened as a result of the Antonori uh, Zavos debate is that, in fact, Congress has started to wonder whether or not they shouldn't actually impose restriction on people like him, and actually I commend that. But isn't the reality that they will find some country somewhere where the work can be done? Uh, yes, of course they will. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that we should allow science to come into disrepute and be misused in civilised countries. And I think that we actually have to show the world some leadership. Certainly you're entering an arena where you're constantly under attack. I'm not talking about here tonight, I'm talking about generally your career move. Well, uh, you know, I'm still a reproductive specialist and I do see patients and we estimate anywhere between two to three million people in the U.S. could very easily benefit from this technology and therefore, you know, this is not, as we say in Kentucky, this is not hey. Zavos is, is undeterred people, by the defeat. His objectives and timetable remain unchanged. A cloned and, uh, human embryo by 2003. First thing you've got to do is, I guess, find the patients. We have no problem with that. We have thousands of people that have already volunteered or wish to be part of this effort. How many thousand? It's above a thousand. Now, bear in mind, we haven't solicited any one of them yet. By process of elimination, we would uh, reduce that number to about approximately 70 couples, meeting some of the criteria and standards that we're looking for, medical standards, ethical standards. We then will reduce that number of the first to be cloned for reproductive purposes down to 10 couples that we think would, would provide us with the best prospects for success, because we do need to be successful. Dr. Zavos believes that cloning should be available to those who cannot have a baby any other way. The theory of how to achieve that clone is relatively simple. The DNA of the person wishing to be cloned is contained in a single cell. A donor egg from another woman will be emptied in a process called enucleation. Then, the cell with the DNA of the person who wishes to be cloned will be drawn into a pipette and inserted into the enucleated egg. The egg, now in a fusion chamber, will be persuaded by an electric shock to accept the cell as if it were a sperm, so that it will divide and become an embryo. That's the theory. In refining their techniques, the team, some of whom prefer to be anonymous, also knew they had to try to reduce the risk of deformities in the children they hoped to create. Midway through 2002, they began a number of animal trials. They used cow eggs. The bovine egg is a very robust one and uh, can be enucleated very nicely. 
and it can be injected. Also, it, it tolerates a lot of uh, manipulations. Uh, the same, not quite that level, holds true for manipulations on the human egg. You can feel it and see it. That is also quite a good, robust egg. You may use fluorescent staining that stains the chromosomes, and then you can be sure that you enucleate it properly. We place the cell into the bovine oocyte, but not inside. We attach the cell. How does this work with uh, animals? Decided you on the method you're going to use in, uh, in human work? Yes, it's, it's very comparable. Our animal modeling gives us uh, a very good success rate of up to 60 percent. Um, By success you mean? Meaning that we can create um, embryos uh, via this method. They also decided to insert human cells into enucleated cow's eggs. It's a human granulosa cell. I turn it gently. The cell should stick now nicely here to the surface of the oocyte. The amazing thing is uh, that we can take human granulosa cells, the same status, non-frozen, non-manipulated, fresh, out of, out of culture, and place them the same, exactly the same way, into bovine, into bovine oocytes that are anucleated, and can induce uh, development of those, of those uh, eggs into embryos about the same level as well, 50 to 60 percent. Which means that all those maneuvers that you do, parthenogenesis, uh, bovine on bovine, and human granulosa cells on bovine oocytes, that the technology that you're applying is atraumatic, reasonable, yielding the results that you're looking for, and that there's no significant variations between the three assays that you're performing. By November 2002, Zavos decided they would soon be ready to begin human trials. They were ready to start choosing the patients. The patients who've come to see Zavos in Lexington have one thing in common, they're all desperate. Among them is a doctor who understands both the process and the implications. He's asked not to be identified. We've uh, gone through everything that reproductive medicine currently has to offer. With the aging effect along with the onset of subfertility for both of you, you yes. feel like that it is, it is the way to go. Well, yeah, absolutely. That was uh, the primary reason that we stopped was because we both reached, well, in particular my wife reached her early 40s. Given the history of no success, there was really an abysmal chance that uh, we would succeed if we continued along that route. We pretty much decided that uh, probably I would be the first one to be cloned, but then, you know, if it worked, then we might go on to have another child. Most people simply don't understand the position that we're in. Ninety percent of people have children by normal means. The remaining infertile couples who do seek assistance, uh, about half of them succeed. And the other half are in the same position that my wife and I are in. We have run out of options. In a time when it's possible to adopt or foster, why is it important to you to have a genetically related child? Well, that's a pretty philosophical question in a way. Uh, my own feeling about that is, you know, you form a bond with somebody when you marry them and the idea the feeling, the expectation is that you have children as a result of that bond. And when it doesn't happen, it's... Does the existence of deformities and genetic problems in the animal work concern you? Well, it concerns me to some extent, but I think one has to bear in mind uh, the fact that normal reproduction isn't perfectly safe. I think you have to frame this discussion within the context of the incidence of deformities and malformations that are present in normal reproduction. I believe that's about 3%. So what would it take to make cloning safe? If you could bring that 
rate of malformations or deformities down to a level that's seen with normal reproduction, that would be acceptable. If there were a deformed child? It's tragic. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. But as I point out, you know, there's a 3% incidence of significant abnormalities and deformities in the normal population. And frankly, I'm of the view that the more we learn about this process and the better it's perfected, there's a very good chance that eventually it could be so effective as to result in a less risk than normal reproduction. I'm a firm believer in that. In New York, Bill and Kathy are also among the patients who want Zavos to help them. Kathy, in her 40s, has already had five miscarriages and has tried IVF six times over two years. How hard have you tried to have a baby of your own? Probably harder than any couple I know of anywhere. We have a nice house, we have, live in a nice neighborhood, we know nice people, nice friends, where it's nice being aunts and uncle to everybody's children, but it would be nice to be mommy and daddy to one of our own. So, that's it's painful, it hurts. We've tried everything humanly possible to have a live, healthy baby. It's probably cost us between forty-five, fifty thousand out of our own pocket. That's that's an easy estimation. We, at least forty-five to fifty thousand dollars. Probably over a hundred thousand dollars if we didn't have any coverage. Bill and Kathy decided cloning was the last chance of having a child of their own. Their doctor agreed to help them. This doctor, amongst many other doctors, are perfectly in accord with the C word. And I say C-word rather than cloning because a lot of people have a misunderstanding or misconception, as I did and everybody does about cloning. And we had a lot of soul searching and a lot of thought went into this, both biological, emotional, religious, before we went further into this. It wasn't something that we haphazardly jumped into. I don't know if I like the word clone. I wish they used another word for it. We just want a healthy baby. And she's such a wonderful, wonderful woman. I know if there's a baby that's so similar to her that the baby would be a wonderful, wonderful baby. We need to have our child. We need to complete the circle, the circle of life. We do such silly things and we realize silly things. We have two backpacks and we've named the backpacks names and we treat them like our children. It's sad, but true, we laugh about it, and we treat them like, oh, that's Brownie and that's Harry, and then they're our little kids after Harry Potter, you know, and we make them our kids and they're not. And we, and we love each other, we have a great marriage, and we're bond but there's, there's an emptiness in not having our own child, and if there's any way humanly possible that we could do this, we want to do this. Has it been explained to you that a termination might be necessary? Of course, yes. yes. And you would agree with that? Of course because you have to agree to it? Of course, absolutely. I think that would be very unfair to, to knowingly bring somebody into the world uh, that's not correct. Dolly developed or indicated things which didn't or hadn't or wouldn't show in, in uh, screening before birth. I'm thinking of breathing difficulties and that sort of thing. Uh, you're aware of that? Anything can happen with any child. Anything could happen, and yes, I am aware of that, and anything uh, could happen. But we, we can't uh, 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 live life like that, uh, being afraid of, of failure or disaster. Um, I, I always remember the last words of Oscar Wilde on his deathbed. Oscar Wilde. Uh, quite an uh, infamous and famous person, they asked him, Mr. Wilde, do you regret anything that you've done? Because he did quite a few things. And he said, uh, my dear young man, the only thing I regret are the things I didn't do. Cyprus, late summer 2002. Zavos feels comfortable here, protected by friends and family. It's here that he's chosen to interview many of his prospective patients. On the screen behind you is the last image of the presentation you give the patients. What's the words at the top there? Those are words that I have used when I address the U.S. Congress, which are very strong words. I think that those are very, uh, they come very close to my heart. What I truly believe, and that is, these that ban this technology will not be the Neil Armstrongs 
that would fly us to the moon and walk us on it. But I noticed that's uh, not Neil Armstrong's face in the space helmet. That's correct. That's my face. Sorry? That is my face in Neil Armstrong's uniform. Simply to put that it would take a great deal of effort to go there. And we're willing to get there. How do the clients, the, the patients, react to that? They smile at it at the beginning, but then they say, I think you're the man that is going to take us there. Does uh, Neil Armstrong know that you've done that? that? If he knows that? I don't think so, but those are impact statements, and we want people to know about our seriousness of purpose here. You say that you're not actually going to carry out the cloning work here in Cyprus. You're thinking of two centres at the moment, aren't you? I mean, you've met two groups since you've been here. Yes. IVF programmes in this world today are equally equipped, whether you're in downtown London, uh, New York, or in Ukraine somewhere, or in Beirut, or in Libya, whatever that might be. And they don't ask for very much other than just to share their facilities with us and share some of the fruits and efforts with us. The scientific work has gone on in an atmosphere that has veered between controversy and outright hostility. Many nations, including the UK, have banned human cloning completely. The US House of Representatives has also voted in favour of a ban, though the Senate has yet to rule on the issue. So Zavos and his team have sought other locations for their work, both to protect the identity of their patients and to avoid violent reactions from those who oppose cloning. I've been involved in the establishment of the Middle East Fertility Society, and so I have many, many, many friends, good friends in the Middle East, and, and therefore I have no difficulty working with any of them, from Cairo to Amman to uh, Riyadh to Beirut to whatever. There are those who say, well, you haven't been doing very much in the last year. Well, those are the people that don't know what you're doing, obviously, and uh, they don't know what it takes to get here where we are now. Uh, we're not announcing pregnancies prematurely. We don't announce things in the news just because we want to make the news. We will make the news when it's time, but not before it's time. They need political approval wherever they work. Before they visit the medical facility here, they must meet the local religious leader, the Imam. Last month, Zavos was in Israel on a similar mission. The Imams and the Archbishops in this part of the world play a very important role. Um, and so, the politicians may have power, but the religious leaders in this region of the world have the ultimate power. And so it is important for us to be accepted by them and be given the blessings so we can proceed further. Their visit takes place a week after the Twin Towers terrorist attack of September the 11th. There's some distancing to do. We go above the media, we go above the politics, we go above uh, the American politics especially to be here with him because we know what he represents. He represents the spirit of the people. Perhaps unexpectedly, the Imam is both knowledgeable and accommodating about cloning. We think that cloning is the same process that human beings are doing in normal reproduction. Early in 2003, Zavos travelled to the Ukraine, still seeking partners and the raw material for his work, human eggs. The Kiev Institute's director is Professor Fedir Dakno. I'm glad you come to me. It's very uh, honored for me. And so I, uh, I will know all your aims, all your decisions. What can we discuss? We wish to pursue a number of different areas. Uh, one, of course, is the cloning issue. It's something that, that we are interested in pursuing 
some of the basic research and, and clinical aspect of it here. Mm -hmm. um, I'll bring you up to date on some of the things that we've done and we're doing right now. Uh, I'm very interested in the oocyte freezing aspect of it. Uh, we can set up an oocyte donation program in Kiev that can go around the world. Will you be able to help them achieve their goal of a human clone? Very difficult to say uh, exactly no or exactly yes. It's my opinion, it's my own opinion, that medicine, the science today, are not ready yet to work in a colonial, a reproductive cloning. Because we have no very good fundamental studies. We have no explanation from veterinary medicine. I think it is very near future. Maybe five or ten years later, we change our point of view. On the evening of March 13th, 2003, the Zavos team were working late at their covert laboratories. They were inspecting four eggs collected from a woman aged 46 who wanted to be cloned. Providing it works, it's the only way I can have a baby with my own genes. I've tried every procedure so far. I started out with artificial insemination, and I couldn't even count how many, maybe around 15 to 20 artificial inseminations. And I had four IVFs at NYU. Have you any idea what it's cost you over the years? Oh, yeah. It's, it's been a lot. Is it, believe me, it's in the a lot category. <laughs> and why did you delay so long in having a child? I really wanted to wait until I was married or, you know, not just with a boyfriend when, until I was married. I never found a husband yet. And so when I got to a certain age, I said, well, I don't think I can, maybe I shouldn't wait till I get married. Maybe I can have the kid and then find the guy. <laughs> To create a clone of the woman, a healthy egg from a donor is needed to carry the woman's DNA. A number of women have volunteered to give their eggs, among them, Laura. I wanted to donate my eggs. And, and why do you want to give your eggs? I would like to help other people have children. I just had a child of my own and it's a beautiful thing. Laura is 23. Her baby, Rihanna, is only a few months old. Dr. Zavos. Um, is just going to take my eggs. Um, when he uses them, he's not using my DNA. My DNA is going to be out, and then somebody else is going to be put in. How far would you be prepared to go to help someone have a child of their own? I would carry it for them, surrogates do. I would donate my eggs. I would do whatever I had to do, whatever was necessary. Does it worry you that you will be the first to go down this road? Oh, well, that doesn't worry me. Um, you know, someone has to be the first, and um, I just hope everything turns out, you know, good. And Dr. Zavos, he, Dr. Zavos doesn't seem to feel that this is an experiment. A lot of people would think of it as an experiment, because the first, he doesn't see it that way. Do you see it as an experiment? <laughs> I guess I'm just like the rest of the planet. I would see it as an experiment. Um, but when I talk to him, he's so confident, and, um, and I, I'm not the expert. He's the expert. She's a typical uh, person that qualifies under our program, which means the following. She exhausted all possibilities uh, of ever becoming a parent using her own DNA material. Um, she spent a sizable amount of money going from New York to Los Angeles and somewhere in between. Uh, so the, the best in the business as far as IVF. And therefore, um, there comes to a point that those people can be helped uh, by no other way than this method. And that's pretty much what we, we thought from the beginning we would be doing. Uh, we would not make this procedure available to people that are just walking in here say, clone me. I have money, I have fame, I have whatever. Uh, that's not what qualifies people to participate in our program.
The DNA of the woman who wishes to be cloned is contained in every cell of her body, including the granulosa cells that surround the eggs that were collected from her the day before. These are young protective cells normally discarded each month during menstruation. On March 14th, the Zavos team enucleated the donor eggs into which the woman's DNA will be inserted. Some cytoplasm. Yeah, now the polar bodies are removed. So that was very nicely enucleated. Not too much for the human egg. Now I pick up a cell. This is one of her granulosa or somatic cells, and it was inserted into the enucleated donor egg. Now it's injected. In the fusion chamber, an electric shock will enable the cell to enter the egg just as if it were a sperm. Sperm is, is using enzymes to penetrate that membrane, uh, but the somatic cell doesn't have these enzymes on the surface so we have to electrically perforate and then the injected cell will fuse and the nucleus will then, like a sperm nucleus in, in fact, become integrated in, in the egg's cytoplasm. Without the fusion, the cell will, will just sit on top and will not have the possibility to enter. The eggs containing the woman's DNA were taken to the fusion chamber to be stimulated into activity. I'm just washing them a little bit. And then I transfer them into the fusion chamber. I just have to roll them a little bit so that the egg cell and the fused cell is in this line. North-south? It, it is north-south. Either the cell is north or the cell is south, but it should be in this line, not in this line, nor even in that line. That would be very, um, no effect on fusion. So the current has to go through like that. So now, now it's all right. Now, activate the fusion. How long a jolt do you give it? I give an AC of 5 seconds and a DC 20 microseconds in two pulses. Altogether, they enucleated nine donor eggs and into each one they inserted the DNA of the woman who wished to be cloned. And now, now I am injecting the cell. Now this cell, no, it's not yet in the proper position. No, not yet. Not yet, no, no, now. Now it's nice to deposit it. Then they waited to see what would happen. The next day there were signs of activity in three of the nine fused eggs. A clear area in the centre where a nucleus could be. We don't know. That's usually what you see when you have the pronuclei in regularly fertilised eggs. But you normally have two. Now this is another one where you have an eccentric nucleus inside uh, at 11 o'clock. These are crucial hours. However encouraging the signs, the whole process may stop and cell division may never occur. It's a long night. Next day, and the egg has divided. The first publicly recorded cloned human embryo appears. Now take a look at this. Wow. So what are we seeing there? We are seeing uh, one large blastomere and uh, two smaller ones, probably at a stage where we have three to four cells. And if we tomorrow look at this embryo and we have the large one also divided, then it tells us that this is growing and, and continuing its development. We have very few fragmentation, in fact, here a little bit on the left side, but, but it looks quite good. How do you feel when you see something like that, after all this work? Well, uh, it's only the first one we have seen so far. Uh, what I must say, it, it looks quite, quite uh, amazing. No? One embryo out of nine. nine. Would you have settled for that? Oh, absolutely, yes. You know, one out of nine is better than 10%. It's a start.
But this is not the way we should have results in the future. We need maybe three, four out of ten that starts with development. This is the important issue. March 17th and the embryo is now six to eight cells. Well, we have to wait. Uh, I think another round of division to see whether we increase the number of blastomeres. I would hope so. Tomorrow is a very important day. Tomorrow, if the development continues, they plan to freeze the embryo. Back into the incubator. All we know what we've done to this egg. We understand all the feedback that it gives us. It says, you abuse me a great deal because very simply, you've done so much maneuvering to me that uh, I'm not going to be perfect, but I can assure you that when it's time for me to implant and give rise to a fetus and a baby, I probably will be doing okay. March the 18th, day five. We have about eight to 10 cells now, fairly round blastomeres some smaller ones, very little fragmentation. The embryo is slightly behind schedule, but we will see this afternoon. We will now switch to another medium and hope that it continues its development. This is the first provable cloned human embryo designed specifically to produce a baby. The plan is freezing, put it in a state of quiescence, and then scrutinize this embryo as best as we know how. One cell will give us the information that we want before we transfer for implantation. In this particular case, it will be a gestational surrogate that would receive this embryo, and then wish us good luck. As Zavos and his team work on, the woman who may soon become mother to the first human clone sits and waits. He is going to go with the surrogate first because of my age. To me, that's common sense. It's better odds if there's a 20-year-old lady, they'll take better. And this is his gig, it's not my gig. You know, if he wants it to work, there's a better chance for it to work with the younger girl. Why have you decided to do this interview anonymously? There could be 10 people who are really, really for this procedure. And there could be just one person that says, oh, I'll prevent this, <laughs> I'll go get him, I'll prevent this from happening, you know. I've been saying that all along, that human will be easier to clone than any other species because we do know more about the human than all other species all put together. So what are your plans now? Well, the plans are to proceed with, uh, with another group of patients. Now it's going to be a group of patients, not just a single patient. It's well worth it because you know, at least I'll have a baby with my own genes. Um, everybody, the whole planet Earth will know that this can be done. Someone has to be the first. Someone has to be brave enough to do it. It's a beautiful beginning. But as we say in the U.S., it ain't over until it's over.